Folks, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, this afternoon's session, um, to the Metallurgical, or Mineral and Metallurgical Processing Divisions Award Plenary Session. Uh, we've been doing this for a few years now, and it's been very successful, bringing together all our awardees and getting everybody, all the metallurgists in one room, uh, just really, I think, shows our community and just as a group, it's, it's a, great, a great opportunity to talk amongst ourselves and, and just enjoy time together. My name is Scott Shuey. I'm serving as the 2020 Program Chair, uh, Director with, of Process with Newmont. Uh, this afternoon's session features lectures by this year's award recipients of our three major awards. And all three are, Dr., or excuse me, Mr. John Gacky, recipient of the Anton M. Godin Award, James Vanderbeek, recipient of the Robert H. Richards, H. Richards Award, and Bill Imrie, recipient of the Milton E. Wadsworth Award. Uh, we'll also be presenting a certificate to this year's winner of the Rong Yu Wan PhD dissertation scholarship. Uh, at this time, I'd like to ask Komar Quatra, chair of the 2019 Godin Award Committee, to come to the for coming this for this talk and thanks Scott I'll present this award I would like to take this opportunity to thank members of the Gordon Award Committee those who are here that were uh, and then uh, the Gordon Award was established in 1975 and is presented for scientific or engineering contribution that further understanding of the technology and I'm honored to introduce 2019 Gordon Award rep recipient, John Gatke. John. I suggest you get to know John Gatke, and he's a very interesting person. <laughs> uh, I have known him all my life, <laughs> complete 18 minutes of today. <laughs> and you will really enjoy seeing okay. him. Thank you. And Thank you. this presentation is going to be very dynamic. Thank you. Now, my wife might say I'm a very interesting person too, but maybe not in always a good way, huh? <laughs> uh, I am going to pull a little bit of a different uh, Tack today, I've decided not to bring any PowerPoints. So I'm just going to talk. <laughs> no pictures. <laughs> I want to thank the selection committee and everyone involved for the award. I don't know how the process came about. My wife knows because she was contacted by somebody, but she has not told me. <laughs> Yeah, she's sworn to secrecy, so I have no clue how this really happened. But if you're in this room, all of you that were in this room or in this room that had something to do with this award, I do thank you. I looked up a little bit of information on Gaudin. It turns out that he was a man of considerable talents and accomplishments, which, of course, is no surprise. During World War II, he led a team, and I don't know if any of you know this, but during World War II, he led a team of scientists that were uh, tasked with the force, with the task, given the task of uh, treating low-grade tailings from South America. They weren't after gold, they were after uranium. And the experts at the time said it wasn't possible to do, but under Gaudin's leadership, they did it. One author said that it was proven to be a, a, a task or a success that was proved to be invaluable for the war effort. I worked for Newmont for a number of years at the Plato Malazimov uh, facility, and it turns out he was a student of Gaudin. And so there's just a small connection there between the two. A lot about this award is kind of being in the right place at the right time. They say timing is everything. When I started my career in 1971, the price of gold was $45 an ounce. Eight years later, it had bounced up to almost $460 an ounce. I looked at it today and it is what? 
$1,600 an ounce. Wow. If it hadn't been for gold, I guarantee you I wouldn't be here today. <laughs> I never thought I would make a living uh, working with gold. It's interesting when you tell people what you do or they ask you the question of what you do. How do you explain that to people? I tried to explain flotation. That's an impossible task to explain to people. <laughs> so I tell them I'm a metallurgical engineer. That's a lot of blank spot stares you get back when you tell them you're a metallurgical engineer. So I just got used to saying, okay, I'm a chemist. I'm a chemical engineer. They nod their head and they sort of say, all right, I understand. No, you really don't understand. <laughs> but I enjoyed my career. I got a lot of satisfaction out of my career. They say that if you get four days out of five that you enjoy your job, you've hit the jackpot. And I think I can truly admit that on average, I hit four days out of a week. <laughs> there were days when it was no days out of the week. <laughs> but I was very satisfied with my career. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the people I worked with. I met a lot of people during that career. And it covered a span of 44 years. And during that 44 years, I got to understand that it is not a career is not made up of just yourself. A career is made up of all the people that work with you, that come alongside of you to help, that give a hand to you, give some helpful advice. And so all those, to all those people, I want to give a hearty thank you. Some of them are here today. I'm only going to mention a couple, but there are lots more. Gary Simmons was one of my clients at Hayes and Research. Gary and I go back decades, don't we? I mean decades. <laughs> Eric Spiller and, uh, got me, helped get me hired on at Newmont. And I want to thank Eric for that. He, go, he and I go back way to the days of Colorado School of Mines Research Institute. Uh, a lot of you haven't even heard of that place. It used to be a very active place. Those were a lot of good days. I'd like to thank Mark Levere. He's also here. I think he put up with me for a lot of years <laughs> at Newmont. I was one of these guys, what, yeah. I was one of these guys that didn't, didn't always follow the rules. Was I supposed to start this timer here? Okay. I've still got 35 minutes. <laughs> okay. So it's his fault if I go over, right? You know, they say the definition of an experience is when you make a mistake and you recognize that you made the same mistake before. You've heard that maybe? I'm very experienced, I guarantee you. I'm very experienced. I've made a lot of mistakes. But I've learned from those mistakes. And I think that's part of, part of having a career is to learn what you've made mistakes at before. I think, as I've already said, I think part of the careers of people that you have behind you. And I've come to realize as I went through this presentation that it's easy to take people for granted. And we've got to be careful about that. One of the people I'd like to thank as I face this award is my wife. She put up with me for a lot of years of coming home stressed, weird hours, uh, sometimes a little grumpy. <laughs> but she was always there to give me encouragement, and I thank her so much for sticking with me, and we found we make a pretty good team. I have a passion for flotation, and that may sound crazy, but I think flotation is an absolutely amazing and yet sometimes a puzzling process. As I've said before, it's very hard to explain flotation to anybody that's not acquainted with it. But I think it's a, it's a tremendous process. I, I don't know how you can take dirt ore and put it together with water, grind it up, add a few reagents, put it in a, in a reactor that mixes it and adds air, and what happens? Voila! You've made a separation. It, it's, it's magic. 
but it's not. There's a lot of science behind it. And I appreciate all those who work in research to develop the things that we use nowadays. I worked my entire career in process development. I'm going to talk today about two processes that I had the privilege of working with. <clears throat> and I want to just say a few things here. A few days ago, I read an article about results from a study performed by some researchers on four drugs that they had hoped would be the cure for Alzheimer's. They were confident that they had the cure. And the point of the article was they had failed. One of the researchers came, was talking, and he says, or she, I don't know if it's a he or she, says, we don't have anything now to treat these people. And I got to thinking about that. There were times, and I'm sure Gary will agree with this, there were times when we weren't sure we had anything. We'd spent a lot of time and money working on a process. And there was one in particular I'm going to talk about where it just smacked us right in the face and we didn't know what we were going to do about it. So, I've never worked on a problem whose solution would be anywhere near the importance as an Alzheimer's a cure for Alzheimer's. But I have worked on problems that were enormously important to the people involved. And so I'm going to talk about those two processes today. I've titled my talk today, In the Box or Out. And it was funny, when I was reading this article about Alzheimer's, there was a gentleman who made a comment, and I think his comment was kind of poke at the researchers, but I think at the same time he was trying to give them encouragement. And his comment was, after they said they didn't have anything, he said, well, maybe it's time to think out of the box. And that's what I want to talk about today, thinking out of the box. It's not a new concept. In fact, people through the centuries have been making wonderful discoveries because they were able to think out of the box, to get away from conventional thinking. I read the other day that Thomas Edison has 1,093 patents to his name. That was a man that thought a lot about out of the box, didn't he? The first problem I'm going to focus on today, who's going to give me a time signal? OK. The first person, the, uh, project I want to talk today was strictly a flotation project. Had nothing else to do. We were, we were uh, given the task of developing a flotation process for Santa Fe for their Lone Tree project. The second problem I want to talk about today had nothing to do with flotation, but flotation ended up helping to solve the problem. It was a problem with pressure oxidation. Now you ask, how can flotation help pressure oxidation? I hope I can explain it to you today. Now, fair warning, this is not a technical discussion. I am going to give you some data, but all the data I give to you has already been presented in papers in past uh, conventions. What I'm really interested in today is to talk about the things that went on behind the scenes. You know, when you pull the curtain back, what did you see going on? There are three words I'd like you to pay attention to today as I progress through this. One is curiosity. They say curiosity killed the cat. And if that was true, I'd been dead long ago. My wife calls me George, uh, Curious George. I love to be curious about things. When she takes me out on excursions, I get lost because I get sidetracked because I'm curious about something I see. I spent a lot of my career being curious. The second thing is freedom. You know, curiosity is good, but if you don't have the freedom to pursue that curiosity, it does you no good. At, at Hazen, I had a tremendous ability to be curious, and I had the freedom to explore that curiosity. And much to Mark's chagrin, I took freedom 
at, Mo at Newmont to explore curiosity. So if you're here and you're a supervisor, give your people room to be curious. Give them some freedom. And the th third thing I'd like to mention t this morning or this afternoon is, is the word persistence. Curiosity is good, but you've got to be persistent if you're going to reach the end. <clears throat> there are a lot of times when persistence was the only thing that paid off for us. All right. The first problem was the flotation of auriferous pyrite. This is pyrite that carries gold values with it. Sometimes it's called arsenium pyrite because there's always a little bit of arsenic with it. Typically, uh, it's a very difficult material to float. In the old days, uh, you can't see this gold under the optical microscope. You can assay it, but you can't see it. In the old days, they called it invisible gold. I've been away so long from the business, is it still what they call it, invisible gold? I used to hear the term solid solution gold and sometimes colloidal gold. It is gold that is refractory. It will not respond to cyanidation. And if successful, flotation will produce a concentrate that will still need to be processed by some form of oxidation to achieve a product that could be amenable to cyanidation. In the early 90s, Santa Fe Gold came to Hazen with the desire to develop flotation for processing their arsenium pyrite from their Lone Tree mine located near Winnemucca. You might say, well, simple enough, just float the pyrite. It's not that easy. For Lone Tree, the pyrite occurred in grains ranging from 75 microns, plus or minus, to as fine as less than 20 microns. Just to add insult to injury, some of the pyrite was classified as amorphous. In other words, it had no crystal structure. And I say tongue in cheek because they had one other form that mineralogists like to refer to as framboidal microcrystalline pyrite. It occurred as particles less than 10 microns. That's a challenge to float that stuff. The challenge was that the highest gold grades in the pyrite occurred in the finest particle sizes. Wouldn't you know it? <laughs> the coarse gold floated well, the coarse gold didn't contain enough, or the coarse pyrite floated well, and the coarse pyrite didn't contain enough gold to make it worthwhile. So we were after the fine, uh, fine uh, particles. A complicating factor was that the gold bearing sulfides very often occurred as disseminated grains within quartz at sizes of plus or minus two microns. So in other words, you're dealing with middling products where you gotta get those middling products to come up or you're never gonna make recovery. And the pyrite in those middling uh, products were less than two microns. To put this in perspective, and I'm sure many of you know this, the average size of a human hair is generally quoted as being about 70 microns. So there we were, we were faced with floating pyrite that in many cases was near the order of magnitude smaller than the diameter of a human hair. It's pretty small. So, what to do? We attacked the problem in a, quote, conventional way. We ran a lot of tests. I had a young engineer working on it, and he did exactly right. He did a lot of tests, and guess what? It just didn't work. And we, Gary and I, I remember Gary and I sitting down and talking about this, and we thought, is it time to pull the plug? Should we give up? Well, we didn't. I was curious. <laughs> so I went into the lab. I just, I don't know how to explain this, folks, but... To me, it was impossible that flotation couldn't succeed. I just did not believe it. <laughs> uh, I, it was just my passion that, curi that the flotation ought to su succeed. So I went in the lab. I decided to put my own eyes, set of eyes on the problem. 
And when I did the very first test, I noticed that the pH dropped rather dramatically within the first two minutes. In fact, it dropped about two pH units. Well, that's a big drop. And the only thing that was going to explain that was a lot of oxidation going on. Now, it's not surprising that the pyrite was oxidizing. That's not the point. But it was oxidizing very, very rapidly. In other words, before you could even get the wheel rolling, the ball rolling down the hill, you were dead because oxidation had already occurred. So I went in the lab and I thought, okay, what am I going to do? And I decided, just out of curiosity, to try nitrogen. If air is causing oxygen, nitrogen ought to cure it, right? So I hooked up some nitrogen to the float machine and it worked. The recoveries came up several percentage points. A typical air flotation at the time was producing a concentrate with a weight recovery of about 22% and a gold recovery of 75%. When we put nitrogen in, the recovery jumped up to 87%. Same weight recovery, but we were starting to pull in more values. We went to a pilot plant, and ultimately we found out that we could cut the weight recovery by half and we dropped from 22% down to 11% and we still maintained 87%. Now this is with nitrogen. And if you put cyanidation on the float tails, your overall recovery bumped up to 90%. So stepping out of the box for Lone Tree was as simple as using nitrogen to go outside the boundaries of conventional air flotation. Now I know what some of you are thinking. You can't use nitrogen. It's, it's just not there. Well, it turned out that Lone Tree had a pressure oxidation plant running. And with that pressure oxidation plant, of course, is an oxygen plant. And with that oxygen plant, it's the byproduct of nitrogen. So they came together. Now, it, it is niche technology. I admit that. But it brought about some discoveries in other areas that have proven it through the years to be of great value. We were granted patents in 97, 96, and 99, and then later pat patents were granted for using the same process for flotation of platinum group metals. So, stepping out of the box gave the birth of N2 Tech. I think Gary's a good salesman for N2 Tech, at least was back in the old days. All right, pressure oxidation. You know, one of the things that Hazen research uh, was the fact that Terry McNulty and I were talking about this before, the, before things started, that things around there were, different things were always coming through the front door. I can remember doing uranium leeches. Uh, I did a lot of other things. But along the line, somehow, and I, I've tried to think about this, and my senior mind will not remember exactly, but I got into pressure oxidation. And all of a sudden, I was the one that was called in to take over the pressure oxidation pilot plant. I still don't know, remember how that happened. I really don't. <laughs> it's God's truth. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. But I spent half of my career in pressure oxidation. That's a weird combination to have flotation and pressure oxidation as your two career points. So, my second example today is about pressure oxidation. How much time? Left? Okay. <clears throat> I started in pressure oxidation in the early 80s with benchtop batch tests. And I knew, it, I knew if I transitioned into pilot plant, and I then I transitioned into pilot plant testing. Pilot plants have a twofold goal. The first is to demonstrate the viability of the process in a continuous system. And the second is to obtain plant design data. Now, the transition from benchtop autoclave 
to pilot plant continuous operation is a big step. In the lab, you can take a little batch reactor, you can put your material in there, close it up, and get the test started. In a pilot plant, you've got, at, at Hazen, we had a, a, a autoclave, there's a four compartment autoclave that was about three feet long, had a working volume of about 35 liters. But your job is to continuously pump material in, and if you pump continuously, guess what you gotta do? You gotta get it out continuously. Now that doesn't sound difficult, but it was a big, big hurdle. We had pumps that we thought would work. They didn't. We had these little pumps with check valves. Well, you try a check valve on a small scale, and you get one little grain of anything in there, and that check valve isn't going to start checking. And before you know it, you got autoclave pressure coming back through the pump, and you got a mess. And it is just not a hor it's a horrible sight, and it's not good. So we had to develop a method to continuously pump slurry into a vessel operating at pressures up to 500 PSI. Let me tell you a true story about how we came across our pumping method. We had an engineer out at Hazen who liked to go out and buy used equipment. I don't know where he got the money, because they wouldn't give me any money, but they gave him money to buy used equipment. And he'd bring it back, and he'd put it in our boneyard. And I think he bought equipment thinking that he was going to use it on one of his projects. I was up against the wall. I could not get pumps to work in our autoclave pilot plant. And I went to talk to him. He was a pretty smart guy. He said, well, I might have a pump out in the back that will work for you. And we walked out to the back boneyard. And there was a pump that was about this long. It's a Moino pump, OK? It was a nine-stage Moino pump. Every stage in a Moino pump at that time was good for, I think, 40 to 45 PSI. We had the pump we needed. We hooked it up, crossed our fingers, and sure enough, it worked. And that became the standard pump that we used for our autoclave. I think at one time, we were probably the best customer for Moino parts in the whole city of Denver, probably in the western United States, at least for that size pump. The other problem we have is injecting oxygen into the slurry within the autoclave because the injection ports would plug. Now you wouldn't think if you're pumping oxygen in uh, at a, that you get plugs, but they, they dry out at the tip and that dryness works its way back through the nozzle and before you know it, you don't have an open port to pump oxygen for nothing. So what were we going to do? Well, it turned out if you pump a little water down that injection port, it works great. That's where those high pressure check valve pumps came in handy. They weren't good for slurries, but they were good for water. There's, this, and this is a problem. I, I quite honestly, I, I just can't tell you how much of a problem this was. We could pump in, we could pump out, we could get oxygen in, but we couldn't measure the oxygen. There was no such thing as a mass flow meter back then at least not at the pressures and the rates we were talking about. Now, how do you run an autoclave or something that you're injecting oxygen in without measuring the mass that's going in? We winged it, <laughs> be quite honest with you. We got by. We could watch the temperature. We could know pretty well what was going on, but it was tough times. All right, Santa Fe came to, to uh, Pacific Gold came to Hayes one more time. They wanted to do pressure oxidation on their Twin Creeks project. I'm gonna have to cut this a little shorter, but we tried some initial lab tests. The thing about the Twin Creeks ore is that it has organic carbon in it. Pressure oxidation is not known for being a good carbon oxidizing method. <laughs> You know, we, uh, we ran a lot of tests. They didn't look too good. Gary pulled the plug on us, and he switched over to roasting and a few other things. But because of environmental reasons, it was nice to be able to think we could come back to pressure oxidation. 
Well, it turned out in the early phase of testing, we had looked at some very fine grinds. They were finer than what we thought were commercial grind sizes. But we tried them because of curiosity, okay? The results look good. So when Gary came back, he did a cost study, and the cost study showed that we could probably go down to 20 microns. That's a fine grind. And when we went down to 20 microns, it worked. We developed this process. It worked good. We were quite confident, weren't we, Gary? We thought we had the tiger by the tail, so to speak. So we went into a pilot plant. And the first set of tests worked really well. We got the recoveries that the lab said we should get. And then we hit the second set of samples and everything fell apart. <coughs> Not just a little, but big time. Our gold recoveries that we expected to get were from 92 to 95 percent, but they dropped down to 49 to 75, 72 percent. When you're at that point, you don't have anything, just like the Alzheimer's researchers. You don't have anything. You cannot build a plant based on 49 percent. We knew we had a problem. We decided to suspend the pilot plant operation until the problem could be resolved. And we checked a lot of things. We went back and checked all our data. Uh, we reassayed. We did so many things. We couldn't find anything wrong. I was relieved because I thought the pilot plant itself had failed. I mean, I was the guy that was responsible for it. But we nothing could, we couldn't find anything. And so we knew we had an even bigger problem. And so we called a meeting. Gary called what I called, a, uh, organized what I called a, a war room meeting at Hazen, and he brought in a lot of experts to help. We had a lot of theories about what was going on. We devised some tests to try to see if we had surface coatings are happening. Uh, maybe the carbon was preg robbing, but our tests had showed, our assays had showed that the carbon was not preg robbing, so that didn't turn out to be the problem. And so we, we just didn't have anything. And this is where curiosity came in again. I thought if it's carbon, and there was a little bit of clues there that it might be carbon, I thought what if we could just separate the carbon and take a look at just the carbon? So what do you think I did? I went to Float Lab, <laughs> ate a carbon con, <laughs> very simple, dirt simple almost. And it was those carbon cons that eventually gave us the secret of what was happening in the autoclave. There was some chemistry going on. And it was only that little simple task of generating a carbon concentrate that showed, gave us the solution. We moved on, knowing what the problem was, thinking what the solution was. We were confident in the solution. We were confident, just like those Alzheimer's researchers, but were we confident enough to start that pilot plant back up? Pilot plants eat a lot of core. They take a lot of resources. They're very expensive to operate. And that was a big gamble. I don't think Gary and I wanted to take that gamble of starting that autoclave plant up again. We needed to have a lab procedure. Now remember, the lab had proven, showed us that we could do good, we could get the recoveries, but then when we went to the pilot plant, it failed. We couldn't use lab tests to test our theory. They were gonna show the same thing. They showed success before, there was no reason to believe they wouldn't show success again. What we needed was a process that what? Would fail in the lab. We needed a process that we eventually developed, which we called a semi-continuous lab test. And it was a process where we could take a lab autoclave, pump in, and get discharge on a semi-continuous basis. That thing was just going like this. And it mimicked exactly the chemistry that was going on in the autoclave. And we could, we could achieve failure with that test. Now, that's a funny thing to say, but we could achieve failure. 
But at the same time, we could test our theory to see if, if our theory was right about what was going on in the big clave, and we were able to literally turn gold recovery on and off. And so we resumed the pilot plant, this time a little more confident than we were before, and we had success. We came out of that pilot plant, we ran a long, long, long time, because there's a lot of things that came out of that pilot plant where, uh, I guess I'd call them interesting things. They gave us a lot of avenues to go down, to investigate. And I, I think Gary and I had a lot of satisfaction out of that plant, a lot of stress, a lot of stress. But we made it. So, what am I suggesting? Don't be afraid to think outside the box. Step back and take a new look at your problem. Don't overlook a simple solution to resolving a complex problem. Think of how simple it was to float the organic carbon or to use nitrogen. Make room in your thinking process for curiosity. It can spark something good. And as best you can, persist and don't give up. I'd like to close with a, a little story. Oh, wow. Uh, just to put a little humor into the situation here. There were once two ants who lived near a golf course. These ants were out one day by their home, and all of a sudden, boom, a, land, a golf ball landed smack dab near their ant pile. Pretty soon, there was a golfer standing over that golf ball. A whoosh. Dirt went flying everywhere, and after the dust settled, the golf ball was still there. That process repeated itself a second time. The golfer took a swing, the dust cleared, and the ball was still there. So one ant said to the other, looks like we're in a predicament. What do you suggest we do? And the other ant said, it looks like the best, method, uh, best thing for us to do is get on the ball. So I'm suggesting to you, if you're faced with a problem, think outside of the box, get on the ball, and get on with it. Thank you very much. And this is a wonderful talk. This is a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. And let us give him one more time. <laughs> Thank you, John, for a wonderful lecture and for doing a superb job. Congratulations on being selected as the recipient of the Gordon Award. Congratulations. Now I will turn over the podium over to James Gebhardt. James who will present the Richards Award. Thank you, James. Thank you, Kumar. I would like to thank the members of the committee, the Richards Award Committee, for their work this past year. Thanks also go to SME for helping to fund the Richards Award. The Robert H. Richards Award established in 1948 is given to recognize achievement in any form that unmistakably furthers the art of mineral beneficiation in any of its branches. This year's Richards Award recipient is James Vanderbeek. Jim is a metallurgical engineer who has spent the majority of his career involved with two very diverse operations. He started his career at the 
37,000 ton per day Chino concentrator in New Mexico as a student doing thesis research in the plant and advanced to metallurgist, chief metallurgist, and ultimately concentrator manager. Following Chino, Jim was involved in every development phase for the Cerro Verde C1 108,000 ton per day concentrator in Peru, managing process design activities for the pre-feasibility, feasibility, and detailed engineering phases of the project, and was the first concentrator manager after plant startup. The Cerro Verde C1 concentrator commenced operation in 2006 and was the first application of high pressure grinding roll technology in hard rock mining, particularly at that scale. Jim also managed process development and design activities during feasibility and detailed engineering of the Cerro Verde, Cerro Verde C2 240,000 ton per day concentrator that commenced operation in 2015. Jim's award citation reads, for leading the application of HPGR and other innovative comminution technologies in large scale hard rock processing. Please come to the podium, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Well, I do have. Oh, I do have a PowerPoint. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, as Jim said, the citation for this award reads: uh, "For leading the application of HPGR and other innovative comminution technologies in large-scale hard rock processing." I found this a little interesting and actually humorous because I never really considered myself as particularly innovative. Uh, I guess that one person's innovation is another person's necessity or perhaps desperation or perhaps merely common sense. Having said that, we'll try to explore today uh, some of the activities and observations I have been able to experience starting with the struggles to optimize the Chino sag and ball mill performance at this very process, very challenging processing situation. And we'll try to relate how this experience provided a foundation later uh, to develop some of the process design details for the grand Cerverde concentrators in Peru. A concentrator manager once told me, Jim, it's better to be lucky than good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I believe he was referring to being in the right place at the right time. I've certainly been lucky to be in the right place at the right time, time after time. As Jim said, I arrived at Chino in February of 1983. It was about six months after the startup of the full plant. Uh, uh, some of the senior Kennecott commissioning engineers were still on, on site debugging things. I had been provided a fellowship by Kennecott Research to work in the plant supporting thesis research related to sag milling and ball mill and sag mill control. I managed to turn this into a training or learning experience and was able to hang around until July 1985 when Kennecott formally hired me. Price of copper was 58 cents a pound that day. It's better to be lucky than good. We started as a control room operator, metallurgist, and advanced to chief metallurgist and ultimately the, the concentrator manager. I was able to participate in every step of the evolution of the Chino grinding circuit over the years for better or worse. Chino was a great laboratory. Uh, I was able to learn the experience and art of sag milling under very difficult uh, ore conditions, a combination of a very challenging uh, ore body and challenging economic times were the driving force for the almost continuous evolution and extension of the original sag 
ball mill technology to a hybrid circuit that adapted to the challenges of the ore body as well as economic and process uh, challenges. We'll try to discuss the highlights and learnings of these adventures and misadventures. After Chino operations, I transitioned into a corporate technical services role. Being involved in the corporate world was a challenge for me after so many years of being in the mud and the noise and the excitement of operations. But again, I was lucky. One of the aspects of this position was involvement in new projects, specifically uh, process development insight and support uh, to pre-feasibility pre and feasibility studies. In 2002, Phelps Dodge, the owner at the time, was interested in trying to develop the large sulfide ore body at Cerro Verde that lay under the leaching ore body that had been processed since around 1975. There had been numerous unsuccessful feasibility studies performed in the 1990s attempting to justify a concentrator at Cerro Verde. In 2002, the stars aligned. A combination of an intensely committed local staff, insightful mind planning that emphasized economies of scale, and the successful navigation of the complex Peruvian water permitting process by implementing a concept that, that traded <laughs> water from dams constructed in the highlands for sufficient local Rio Chile water rights to drive large-scale concentrator operation. This provided the foundation to construct what is now known as the C1 concentrator at, at uh, Cerro Verde. Uh, again, I was in the right place at the right time. We were able to develop the metallurgical testing program that was the basis for the concentrator process design and advanced from the project, advanced with the project from feasibility to feasibility where the Cabanushan decision took place, detailed engineering, construction, commissioning, and finally I was the first concentrator manager at the C1 concentrator. So Jim had no excuses. We were involved in Later, we were involved in debottling the concentrator, fixing some issues with froth handling and so forth from 108,000 tons a day to 120,000 tons a day. In 2010, we started the journey again, integrating the learnings of our 120,000 ton a day pilot plant into the process designed for the even more grand 240,000 ton a day C2 concentrator that started operations in 2015. So we'll try to share the process, how these learnings from the complex Chino operation influence the development of the Cerro Verde concentrator process and process development. So. What do I do here? The Chino concentrator started at 37,500 tons, tons a day in, in, in 1982. Head grades were much higher in, in that area, 0.84%, targeting a 20% plus 100 mesh flotation feed size, and they were able to get 83, 84% copper recoveries. Uh, the, the original plant was a classic sag mill ball mill configuration with, with 28 by 11 half foot sag mills, uh, typical of the size of the day, 7,000 horsepower each. Closed circuited with double deck screens with the screen oversized return to the sag mill and a very modest variable speed range with the technology of the day and twin 16 and a half by 19 foot ball mills per sag mill at 3,000 horsepower each so the power split was about 7,000 to 6,000 about equal. Uh, Gino is a very challenging ore body. It has very complex alteration structures, there's a lot of softer clays, there's a lot of harder harder material. We have calcopyrite, calcocyte, and, and, and native copper, sometimes in extensive in, in, in significant quantities. Uh, one unique feature was the ore-specific gravity variation from 2.7 to 4.2, uh, and wide variations in ore hardness and characteristics were normal. Here's a sketch by a geologist illustrating some of the variation and alteration types over a, a little portion of the pit. 
And in here you see garnet magnetite is really hard stuff and other stuff that isn't so hard. Um, again, complex. Kind of what it looks like in the field sometimes with a, a lot of variation. Here you see the, not only in the, in the feed size, they got some blockier stuff there and, and finer stuff and, and a bunch of different uh, mineral types or <coughs> alteration types. Here's your magnetite, heavy stuff, a lot of pyrite. Complicates the operation of the sag mill when you combine it with 2.7 SG material. Again, uh, just uh, kind of geologic conditions looking in every direction, looking one direction, you see some of the variation. To the east, similar, similar variation, but different, different stuff. Uh, Lee Hill area where the, where the heavy magnetite is, very, very complex. And finally, here's the other side of the pit. Again, extreme variation, no matter where you look. So very challenging. But that's all we knew. Um, yeah, yeah. My first uh, one of my first experiences at Chino was control room operator, and 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 these are some of the variations you could see on a 12-hour shift basis, 300 to 1600 tons an hour. I remember some nights having to stand by the feeders, the button on the feeder, turning them on and off, and run the sag mill batch because the ore was so hard. Very extreme uh, specific energy conditions, and then the average is about four and a half kilowatt hours a ton. So, uh, one thing that uh, was obvious at Chino is is you have to have a for for Chino to have any kind of hope for success, you had to have a mine plan that allowed some flexibility for blending, and you had to have good cooperation and communication between the concentrator and the mine to make the, the best of uh, challenging situations. The installation of the new sag mill ball mill circuit in 1982 was the first step in the evolution of the reinvention of the Chino grinding circuit. The picture below shows the old plant at Hurley, which is rated at 22,000 tons a day. Uh, another aspect of this project was, was uh, the elimination of rail haulage in the pit. You can see here some, some, some rail cars being dumped. Uh, the primary crusher in this plant was, uh, was a, a jaw crusher that was surplus from the Panama Canal, Panama Canal construction in 1903, and it was one of the best pieces of equipment in the plant. Uh, many days, high clays uh, brought the plant to its knees, running 7,000 tons a day. The new sag plant successfully addressed clay-related grading issues, but challenges remained with uh, high unit operating cost and, and very depressed copper prices. So the pressure was on to increase the throughput divisor. On top of that, future ore conditions were projected to become harder. And these were the drivers for the first major uh, grading circuit modification we did, which was the addition of sag mill pebble crushing. Uh, here, if you're looking on the photo, uh, you see what is known as the, this is the sag screen oversize, also known as the sag mill critical size material, the minus, plus eight millimeters, minus 65 millimeters. The problem with this material is it doesn't break down so well in the sag mill. The, 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 the grinding rates reduce and it just uh, goes round and round uh, and affects the kinetics of the sag mill pretty significantly uh, in theory. If we could crush this and return it to the sag mill, it would improve the, 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 the mill performance. So we built a, a test crushing circuit with a single five foot crusher and three cross belt magnets, uh, which could process the uh, material from one of the sag mills. And we, 
we saw immediately uh, 50 to 60 percent SAG throughput increases under the hard work conditions that reduced uh, as the ore got softer as, as downstream constraints came into, the, into play. There are pretty significant reductions in SAG specific energy also. The Chino general manager at the time came up, reviewed the results of the first day or so, and he declared it's not a test plant, it's a production unit. So many times we have these consultants come in and do these projects and say we have to have a quick win. Well, this was an immediate win. Um, you can see the variation in the uh, percentage improvement with the versus the SAG throughput below. I mention this because I put every dot on that graph. Running this pilot plant was my last job at, job at Chino as a student. They hired me after that. So installation of a pebble crushing plant proceeded very rapidly, started up in early 1986. At this time, there was a pretty limited knowledge about sag pebble crushing, at least to our knowledge, so maybe we'd redrive the wheel. Or, but uh, we produced some design concepts for the pebble crushing circuit. But these are not just for the pebble crushing circuit. These are things that I've, I've kind of used uh, in other activities. And it's related to install some flexibility. Give the, give the operators a chance. Give the maintenance guys a chance. Give the ore a chance. Give the equipment a chance. So we wanted the crushers to be able to, to accept feed from either sag mill and return it to either sag mill. Flexibility. Install some surge capacity de to de decouple the, the, the sag and pebble crushers. Decoupling is very important. Uh, more flexibility. Use multiple smaller crushers rather than a few big ones or one big one. So you can match the uh, equipment capacity to the, the processing, processing rates required. Uh, this process is important to have a very uh, good tramp steel removal system and install the crushers in a centralized location rather than attached to individual grinding lines where there's absolutely no flexibility. The biggest problem we had with the plant was not with the crushers, it was with the magnet system and we learned the hard way and it was had to be completely redone with different uh, technologies but ultimately it worked. Pebble crushing was very successful. Uh, significant improvements for the harder, harder ores and the, it smoothed out the sag mill operation uh, and injected minimal additional operating cost into, into, the, into the process. But, but other issues emerged. Uh, the ball mill circulating loads increased and the product size from the ball mills increased. What was happening was that the, 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 the coarser pebble crusher product sizes uh, skewed the naturally fine sag distribution and, uh, and increased the ball mill feed size. So what was happening was we were using the pebble crushers to eliminate the sag mill critical size, but we were creating ball mill critical size, action and reaction. One, one constraint was addressed while another created or exacerbated. We couldn't go to s finer sag screen openings because, of course, the sag screens were overloaded. So what do you do? Well, we considered a second stage of pebble crushing. The, the objectives and concept for this plant were to process the first stage recycle mat product material in a closed circuit produce a finer feed to the ball mills and 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 uh, that would bypass the sag mills and, and, and allow the sag, the sag mills to run an open circuit. Uh, the, goal was, the goal was to achieve higher sag throughputs at a finer ball mill feed size. Uh, another output of the, uh, the the pilot crushing plant activities was we, we ran the sag mill in open circuit at times. Uh, 
at it and saw what happened. And we discovered that uh, by running an open circuit, we could get better throughput from the sag compared to crushing and returning. This was especially true for the harder ore conditions where we get 10 or 12 percent improvement and reduced for the softer ore. And what this points out is, is the sag mills don't like hard material. For the implementation, we, 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 we gave a, a try at, at testing dry crushing technologies, but they, they exhibited lack of technology, lack of capacity, and, and they generated intense amounts of dust. I, I remember doing test work with something called a gyrodisc crusher, and it cr created an intense amount of dust. You could not see, I could not see my f hand in front of my face, and that that was it for that technology. So we, we, we discovered that the water flush crushing technology could satisfy capacity and product size requirements. So we, we danced with the devil because the devil's, devil gave us what we wanted and uh, advanced with that. But the technology was very interesting. We inject water in the top of the crusher, it enhances the flow of, of ore, for, ore through the crusher crushing chamber and you can get higher capacity at, at finer crusher settings and, and uh, ultimately a finer finer product size and dust, elim dust was eliminated. But uh, on the downside, you can see rapid wear rates on the, on the slurry handling portions of the process and it required uh, sophisticated process control procedures to fully harness the potential benefits of the process. Uh, the power draw of the crusher, for example, uh, under hard, clean ore conditions, you could run less water and pull higher powers. But for the higher clay stuff, uh, you had to run more water. You got less power. You had to choke feed the crusher, otherwise you wore the, the, the liners out in about 10 days. So it gave a benefit, but you had to work at it. So the second stage crushing plant went into service in 1992. We got a, uh, a throughput increase compared to the conditions of the time and the ball mill constraints were significantly reduced. So were the sag mill loading constraints because this material was not coming around anymore. But slurry handling issues made the, the, the plant difficult to operate at times. Um, You see in the, uh, the graphs below, the, uh, the blue one on the left side is sag throughput from 83 to the 94-ish area. Uh, continuous improvement, the, the, the red or the, or the orange is, is the percent plus 100 mesh. So we're driving throughput up, driving flotation feed size up. Plot on the right is Again, the blue is percent plus 100 mesh, continuous increase from approximately 20% plus 100 mesh to 37%, where the red is the recovery, uh, dropping from 84-ish, uh, 83-84-ish to down to 74. I guess there's a relationship, so. So obviously the next step was to uh, expand the grinding capacity. And we looked at enhancing the secondary ball mills and also putting a tertiary circuit in with either big ball mills or verti mills. Long story short, we advanced with large verti mills in a tertiary grinding uh, application, the birdie mills were in closed circuit with their own cyclones and they took the, the, uh, the course overflow from the ball mill cyclones. Uh, we, 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 we had some comfort with the birdie mills because in 1987 we had tested a 450 horsepower tower mill at, at Chino. Um, this was uh, borrowed from the Kaminko Red Dog operation in Alaska, which was on a construction delay and was taking up space in the, in the Metso parking lot in York, Pennsylvania. 
so a deal was worked to allow us to test this thing. Uh, we installed it and ran ball mill cyclone underflow through through it. Not overflow, underflow, relatively coarse material. Um, it was very interesting. The, uh, the bill arrived. We took a look at the screw, and the screw had urethane liners on it. So there were, which we think the wear life was around five minutes. <laughs> there were several spectacular mechanical failures because the liner comes off, it pushes the shaft over and breaks the shaft and then uh, convert to steel liners and the liner comes off, same thing happens, and, you know. So here's a pictorial uh, diagram of the tower mill. You see the characteristics are a relatively small diameter but a high uh, grinding length. Uh, deep column of balls provides a, a good pressure at the bottom, the counter current flow. Testing showed 1.3, 1.4 times higher efficiency than ball mills. Uh, and it actually processed the coarse ball mill cyclone underflow relatively well in between failures. Uh, so to their credit, Shivadala now Mezzo, uh, took these learnings and they completely redesigned the tower mill uh, based upon the Chino experiments. Experience. You see a, 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 a Verdi mill on the right-hand side, large diameter, short height, magnetic liners on the door, never wear out. Uh, one characteristic of the tower mills was we were limited to 80% of motor nameplate so they could start the thing if it stopped. Um, I told them I want to run it 100%, so they, they went back to rename the Verde mill the, 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 the wide body for, for to satisfy Vanderbeek, and it could pull 100%. So. Uh, the modern vertimill, as everyone knows it today, operating around the world, was born at Chino. And that was one of our better efforts working with the vendor in a positive way. So, uh, moving along quickly, uh, here you see the uh, installation of the vertimills in 1992. Uh, magically, there's a, a drop in, in the flotation feed size an immediate drop from 37 to 20-ish, 20 22. And the recovery improved from 74 to 82-ish, so magic. I wonder if there's a relationship. So to summarize the, the Chino activities, uh, very continuous evolution of the grinding circuit. 82, sag, the original sag bulb ball mills addressed the clays pretty well. The first stage crushing plant, uh, uh, 86, addressed sag mill critical size issues. The second stage crushing plant fixed ball mill critical size issues and allowed the sag mill to, to operate an open circuit. We uh, uh, corrected the ball mill capacity issues with the verti mills and, and and the, the whole process uh, allowed performance in the 46 to 48,000 tons a day compared to the original 37,000. So it was all successful, but it, it, it was all action and reaction. And we injected many additional links into the, into the processing chain. So, first stage crushing. Second stage crushing, managing the ball mills and the verti mills. So if it was a perfect world and we get in the time machine, go backwards, what would Chino do? Well, first of all, they'd determine what throughput they really needed to run to be economic, just say 48,000 for sake of argument. Install larger sag mills that could process the harder material at a satisfactory rate. Install larger ball mills that were designed to handle the coarser uh, 
pebble crusher product material, and most importantly, decouple the, the sag and pebble crushing operation with a large stockpile uh, uh, to allow the, the sags to run in open circuit. Okay, my first experience with or, or, or characterization or geometallurgy took place early in my time at Chino when I was still a student. Uh, I attended a morning meeting. The day before, there had been a significant recovery issue related to leaching or, or something being misdirected to the concentrator. The chief metallurgist was invited by the plant manager to discuss the issue in a meeting after the meeting in the lunchroom. This is where the beatings were administered. My office was next to the lunchroom. I could hear the conversation clearly. The plant manager was a salty guy from Butte, Montana. I'm going to read this so I say it right. Uh, he told the chief metallurgist, if it doesn't bleeping float, then it's not bleeping ore. He, uh, he repeated this statement and pounded the table. This was my first real exposure to the concept of ore characterization or geometallurgy, and <laughs> as it's referred to today, and it was really a, a very vivid and unindelible impression because uh, it, it pointed out the, the, the critical importance of not having to look at a salty guy from Butte, Montana, talking, <laughs> complaining about his ore. Some years later, when I advanced to the position of concentrator manager at Chino, we hosted a visit from a representative of a company called Minivex, who was promoting their geomet geometallurgy uh, capabilities. We were having increasing problems uh, uh, predicting the, the throughput, uh, historical approaches weren't working, and this was causing some credibility problems. The Minivex representative described a hardness test that could give a measure of SAG performance using only a two kilogram sample drill core. That meant it was economically feasible to do a, a lot of them to explore variation, which is what Chino needed. This test is called the SPI or the SAG performance index test and it's now well known, but these were early days. The, the SPI and the associated bond in, index work information were integrated into a block model representing the hardness characteristics of the ore body. Minivex had also developed uh, forecasting plant design techniques that recognize sag mill limiting and ball mill limiting conditions. And uh, which were what the operators at Chino were dealing with every day. The Minivex representative was very surprised when the chief metallurgist and, and myself jumped up and kissed him on the lips and said, sign us up. I guess the marketing efforts at other mines were not so cordial. So very quickly here, we got to go. Uh, we did a we did a study with uh, the characteristics here, 87 SPI tests, and oriented over the next one, two, three years. Uh, average of 51 minutes, kind of soft, but interesting. The minimum SPI was four minutes. That's break in your hand stuff. The maximum was 220. That's never break. Uh, Here's the distribution showing different processing situations. Uh, most importantly, they projected 976 sag tons an hour, four kilowatt hours, kilowatt hours a ton. Actual achieved was 968 versus 3.9. That was good enough for me. So uh, I think we're a little Okay, good. I'm on penalty time. <laughs> I just wrote down, okay, I just wrote down uh, a few bullet items of some of my impressions at, at Chino, and, and it was a great laboratory. I was able to learn sag milling from every possible angle, soft or hard or everything in between. Uh, one, one thing that people don't realize is, is Chino had very good operators and, and very good maintenance people. This was masked by the not being able to predict the performance of the plant and other issues. Uh, these we had guys who could control the, the, the sanding level of the launders due to the magnetite but by changing rougher percent solids. And there were many years, several years in a row of, of 94 to 95% sag mill operating time. 
Um, we talked about blending and our characterization. Uh, the Chino situation gave me a very vivid understanding of the importance of process variation. If you can't design for the averages, you got to know the limits. Uh, uh, there is, we don't have time for the process control, but that was a really innovative part of things. One thing that stuck at me was these kind of experts that were there on the commissioning. Uh, they were there for a long time because part of this plant didn't work, but. As a student, I could listen to these guys talk, and I was a sponge, and they argued and, you know, and discussed, and, and just listening to them exposed me to things that I'd never realized. So it wasn't formal mentoring, but it was mentoring. So that, uh, that served me very well. And then throughout the chaos of developing all these uh, process changes, we ran a million man hours without a recordable instrument over several years. Okay. Okay, we advanced with the pre-feasibility pre study for the large concentrator at Cerro Verde in 2001 and two. The objective was looking at sag mill ball mill crusher operation. Uh, uh, it was a a white sheet of paper or a clean sheet of paper. There wasn't much, not any knowledge of the sulfide processing characteristics of the ore body, so we did 135 twinned SPI bond and, and quim, quim scan points, uh, developed in a structured manner. Of course, the quim scan gives the detailed in information on the sulfide mineralogy and the gang mineralogy. Uh, uh, Again, we had a lot of comfort in, in the in the men of XSPI things because we were, had been using in them using them in the Candelaria plant in Chile and the SAG plant down there, and that turns out that was very really pretty close to what Cerverdi looked like. So there's a lot of comfort with what we were doing, but here's a a, a plot that shows the projected uh, SAG throughput. Uh, And you could see uh, there's significant portions of sag mill limited conditions and ball mill limited conditions as, as the interplay between the, the grinding rates and the mill takes place. Just like Chino. Not as extreme, but just like Chino. So advancing with, with big sag mills of, of the day, 40 by 22s and so forth. Uh, and here's what the the plant would have looked like with the with the sag mills. You have the the uh, the sag mills and the ball mills fed by the stockpile. What's immediately obvious is you have this stockpile discharging, and all the coarse stuff goes to this side. All the fine stuff goes to this side. So they're, these guys are looking at we're looking at twenty year twenty eight years of fighting that. But what's interesting here is is the concept here. Here is the pebble crushing plant. Here's the pebble crushing stockpile. So we were able to make the best of it, best of the situation, and this is the plant that should have been installed at Chino. We advanced to feasibility. Again, the focus was completely on sag mills or SABC, but uh, prior to the start of the feasibility, there was more drilling, large diameter drilling, got a pilot plant sample, and got some samples for JK drop tests, and, and, and almost as an afterthought, we collected some samples for HPGR testing. Uh, three samples, harder than average, softer than average, and the most predominant, they were div divided up to, to, to work with three vendors in, in, in Germany, multiple tests, very consistent results, and, and uh, uh, again, feasibility study was, uh, feasibility study was solely focused on SABC, and so, it, but a scoping study was for a midway through the feasibility study that showed replacing SABC with HVGR based, based circuit had a high potential to enhance the project economics. That's what the feasibility language stated, but what really happened was 
It was a dark and stormy night in Vancouver. I was sitting in my office in the floor office. It was a Saturday night, about 7 o'clock. We've been really struggling about how are we going to run 100,000 tons a day through these sag mills. It was clear they'd have to run at the upper, the top limit, the bleeding edge. And, and I'll, finally, I said, I don't see how we're going to do this. So we got the HPGR data out and started messing with that. And you see significant power savings and other savings. So the first thing Monday morning, I was in the office of the floor project manager, or engineering manager, who I had a pretty good relationship with, explained the situation. He said, well, I need some help. We need to develop some capital data and operating data on these conveyors and so forth. And instead of asking for a change order or a project change notice, he had the disciplinary leads in his office in five minutes and they produced some preliminary uh, information that we could use to, to look, build a better case that we could present to the corporate guys and say, we need to do something different. And long story short, uh, we did two feasibility studies in the time of one, one for a SAG circuit, one for an HPGR circuit. This is what the HPGR circuit looked like and what it looks like today. Selection process was driven by economics and risk. Operability, maintainability, flexibility, schedule, safety. HP jars have higher capital costs. There's more conveyors, the bins are up in the air, high seismic zone. But the operating cost is significantly lower, driven by uh, power. There's about a 20% reduction in net power, including all the ancillary stuff, versus the SAGs, and uh, the SAG grinding media disappears. Higher rates of return. Looking at operability, uh, the SAGs are more sensitive to ore hardness and feed size changes than the HPGR. HPGRs eliminate the pebble crushing plant. Uh, a significant concern, which ultimately would have been a fatal flaw, was uh, the potential for overgrinding by the, the SAG plant uh, that uh, under hard ore conditions that would affect the, the tailing sand uh, production. There's a very s strict specification you can't overgrind. HBGRs has uh, some positive effects on the, on the ball mill operation. And, and certainly on flotation, which has not been really explained or exploited, it's very smooth operation versus SAGs, which is all these heavy surf and the roughers. An important fact was, was safety. The HBGRs eliminate uh, the high potential SAG re liner replacement activities, falling muck, exploding balls, metal shrapnel moving big pieces in the mill, confined spaces, climbing in the mill, walking in the mill. Experienced all that. Uh, HB jars is completely offline, just lifting 120 ton piece of steel out of the way and changing the liners in the shop. Okay, the SAG risks were well known. It was mature technology. There wasn't much upside that we can see and the 40-foot sags that we selected, which were the top end at the time, were on their bleeding edge. There's running big ball charges, just a tough situation. On the other hand, the HBGRs had significant operational flexibility. Uh, we could balance the, the, the loadings in the plant with the secondary crusher screen sizes and uh, Shorter schedule. It's so, anyway, to make the long story short, even though the HPGRs were the new kid on the block, not tried, every way you looked at it, the risk analysis pointed to higher risk on the SAGs. And we thought it would be a tremendous battle, but uh, that's the way things went. You know, the combination circuit selection is ordered body dependent. And the 
Sarah Verdi was born to be crushed. Gino was born to be sag milled. HBGR was the right choice for Sarah Verdi, so I'm well a little over, so I think we're going to have to <laughs> stop. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Um, a, a little side story. I, I, Jim doesn't even know this, probably, but I, I, as a young graduate student uh, out of Berkeley, the first job I took was with the Bureau of Mines, and I joined Paul Richardson's group studying fundamentals of sulfide mineral flotation and the application of electrochemistry to that. And you probably need one guess as to which concentrator um, was the first one I went to. Uh, and of course it was Chino. Um, that's something to be said, you know, about the atmosphere of a place that really fosters new ideas, technology. Um, but thank you, Jim, again, for a very informative and interesting lecture. Um, at this time, I'd like to um, welcome um, Scott to uh, present the Wadsworth Award. Thanks, Jim. I'm stepping in for uh, Matt Jeffrey, who serves as chair of the Wadsworth Award Committee. Uh, he's called away overseas, so he's unable to attend um, today. I'm sure everybody in the audience has had that experience where last minute someone gives you a call and you're on a plane off to Australia. So. We know that, what that life's like. Um, but I'd like to thank Matt and all of his committee members, their work selecting this year's award recipient, and thanks also to SME for helping fund the Wadsworth Award. The Milton E. Wadsworth Executive Metallurgy, Extractive Metallurgy Award, excuse me, established in 1992, recognizes distinguished contributions that advance our understanding of science and technology of non-ferrous chemical metallurgy. The, the 2019 Wadsworth Award recipient is Bill Emery. Bill graduated in 65 with a Bachelor of Science Metallurgy from the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, after which he worked at Rio Tinto's Lead Zinc Imperial Smelting in the UK. From 71, Bill spent four years at the Palabora Mining in South Africa in R&D, project engineering and copper smelter operations. In 75, he was hired as manager of the BCL Copper Nickel Smelt, copper, let me say that one more time, copper nickel smelter in Botswana with the task of establishing plant performance after the company's failed attempt to start up the flow sheet with numerous first of its kind and first in scale technology features. Not like we've ever done that before since, have we? Um, from 82 until retirement in 18, excuse me, in 2018, Bill worked in Bechtel's mining and metals division, progressively based in San Francisco, Denver, Brisbane, and Santiago. His various global management roles covered process, and multidiscipline engineering project studies, off project reviews, and process technology. He was elected to Bechtel as a Bechtel Fellow in 2000. Bill is a member of SME and TMS and has chaired a number of technical symposia and committees. Bill's award citation reads, Bill Emery is one of those rare metallurgist, metallurgical engineers who has had extensive experience in the three pillars of our business, technology, operations, and engineering construction. Please welcome Bill to the stage. Thank you, Scott. Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a great honor to, um, for me to join the list of recipients of this award that recognizes the contributions by Milton Wadsworth to our industry. <coughs> when I was approached about uh, this award and the presentation that uh, it requires, I was asked to speak as a generalist rather than a specialist. And it reminded me of the old definition of a, of a specialist being someone who's made all the mistakes that are possible to make in a narrow field. It made me wonder whether a generalist, that meant a generalist, was someone who made multiple mistakes in a more shotgun manner. My, I will, I, I've been involved in a number of commodities, but I'll use in this presentation uh, copper, because copper does reflect a lot of what's happened in our industry. And uh, when, I, when I 
did a little, quick little calculation and realized that uh, when, after choosing this title, that 50 years compressed into half an hour is a scaled down ratio of 200,000 or thereabouts. I have to narrow the field a little bit. Who, who in the room remembers using the instrument on the right hand side? A few hands. Good. <laughs> but this, this particular one is one I bought um, 61, and I think it uh, served my needs for 20 year or 20 plus years. My, f my first acquaintance to uh, a mine concentrator and smelter was as a, as a student in 64. That was in the Copper Belt. And, um, and there was a great introduction. And uh, the world was a, was a lot different from today. Um, I remember being able to walk alongside the uh, conveyor from the crusher building, and particularly with the heavy dosing spray suppression, you could pick out and select the, the minerals from that conveyor. The conveyors were moving slower at that time, so you could reach over and pick out your minerals from the belt. Uh, I think we were, we were typically around 3%. I think in Changa, was, was one of the mines was even higher, around 5%. And uh, I think our tailings grades were probably around today's new run of mine, around half percent. <laughs> anyway, the, um, if I had to pick something that had changed dramatically over those 50 years, I think uh, as a plant metallurgist, the whole aspect of process controls and information has been a remark an area of remarkable change. I don't think in the early years we, we could conceive of having the kind of information for our plants that uh, we have today. And if I go back to the copper belt a little bit, I was fascinated. I met Tony Elteringham last night. We had a little chat, and I was astonished to find that Tony had one, one particular, many recollections that uh, rang the same bell. But one was uh, we both had driven a um, converter aisle crane. And back in those days, in the copper belt at least, those cranes were open cranes. So your method of... Um, Fume control was a bucket of water between your knees and a roll of mutton cloth that was soaked in that, that bucket and you immersed it you put it in your mouth to absorb as much SO2 as possible before you actually inhaled it. <laughs> and uh, and you're, you're vertically above the fumes that come in your direction and uh, that hits your visibility as well. So your, your line of sight for how you how you maneuver this crane is watching the guy who's hand signaling. And of course, there was very well structured, um, clear hand signals for up, down, left, right, etc. So I was fascinated to find some, Tony had <laughs> the same experience as me trying that. And I think, in, I think um, one important thing that uh, the plants did at that time, certainly in Africa, both in South Africa and the Copper Belt, was that uh, graduates had to serve their time of apprenticeship, if you like, uh, doing operating roles and getting hands-on experience with things like that. And um, later on in life, I appreciated those because those practical experiences have a great influence to you when you have to do um, uh, design work and dealing just with the numerical aspects. And uh, some of those early experience, hands-on experience, just remind you a lot about the practicality needs as well. I was maybe fortunate, although it didn't, it's, it sometimes it, it's, it didn't seem like good luck at the time, to be asked and accepted the position that uh, Scott referenced of taking on the job of managing a copper nickel smelter that had been a disastrous failure during startup. And um, you know it had, as, as Tony referenced, had a number of first of a kind aspects to it, and uh, the total flow sheet was first of a kind. And um, I wouldn't wish a failed project on anyone, but if there's any other young engineers here um, who are asked to participate in the recovery role like that, I w my counsel would be to take it. Don't worry about the salary, just take it because the compression of experience you get is phenomenal. And um, 
I, I you know in later years after that experience, I happened to be in a hazard and operability uh, team, a HAZOP team for a project. The project was behind schedule, so we were spending 12 hours a day at least over three and a half weeks. But what was, what was notable is this particular HAZOP, uh, some of you might know the, the whole concept of HAZOP studies was conceived and, op and authored by three chemical engineers with Imperial Chemical Industries. And on this particular exercise that I participated in, the facilitator was one of those three authors. So you can well understand he wasn't in the mood to take any shortcuts. It was a pretty rigorous exercise. He caught me by surprise during one of the coffee breaks when he said to me, how come you're such a pessimist? And, um, and he, when I looked at him, he, he went on to explain, well, so every time we go on to something new, you, 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 you can immediately come out with all the bad scenarios. I think I surprised him when I said, well, I've seen most of them happen. <laughs> and, you know, the pro process controls um, I mentioned, if you, as a metallurgist, uh, need to do a study and collect the data, it meant walking the plant, talking to the operators, collecting operator log sheets, collecting ink charts, uh, when, we, when stuff was recorded, ink charts, and the assays from the lab, of course, and then manually transforming those down to make some sense of it. And if you did analyze and make some sense of it, sometimes you would produce some nomographs that gave some uh, cheat sheet type of help to the control room operator when he was dealing with different feed conditions. And I think um, today it must be too easy to just uh, digest the, the information that comes off your Pi system or whatever. But the values I think of, um, that I re can recall of having to really be on the plant to collect that information uh, meant a lot to me in later years, and uh, so I would counsel those who have become too office-bound digesting the, the, the data that's easily available from the computer. Get out, and, and you, might you might learn a lot just watching, observing, and listening. So if it sounds like um, computers didn't exist in those earlier days, that's not completely true. Um, it was really the beginning of, of computers entering our world. In the same, in 64, same year I was on the cover belt, I was using a computer for slag chemistry, equilibria. At that time, my self-prepared code and program was recorded on a punch paper tape, which I could carry around in my pocket. And the same year in Changa was, I think, the first to um, introduce uh, computer methods for daily metallurgical accounting on the mine and plants. That was the first breakthrough. And uh, I think it was about the same year or, or era anyway, when computer methods were applied to ore body mapping. So it was the beginnings, um, but, it, but it's, but it is true, there were several decades where the use of the computer was confined to some narrow fields, differently from today. Another change in my 50-year window is population change. And you might ask, why does that matter? Uh, this is a graph I, I have of just copper use. And in this case, I've taken the numbers. I watched this a few years ago. It's per capita as opposed to uh, differentiating between countries. It's just for the, a global per capita consumption. And if you look at the correlation in the middle of the plot there, you can see it's that the linear relationship is robust with 0.96. You'll also see on the equation there that the linear correlation is equivalent to a 2% per year steady long-term growth. If we could just get the world to follow the dotted line instead of the devious one, our lives might be a little bit easier. But long term, it's 2%. And then that's per capita, but the, but the number of capitas are increasing at the rate of over 1% just now. 
and that's how you get to a, a 3%. So unless we do something silly with our population or planet, uh, somebody starting a career today might see the same growth over the next half century that, that I have seen. And if you, if you do this for some of the other so-called uh, infrastructural metals, you'll find a similar overall relationship, the actual curves and deviations in response to world events uh, it might differ by metal, but the overall uh, pattern is similar. World events, incidentally, you can see from the bottom the, the Great Depression of the 30s, and you can see at the top just where we've had the expansion of Chinese infrastructure and the, rest, and the, the, the change of direction at the very top. That last number I only was only available about 10 days ago. Going on to, go back to world copper supply. I said I would use copper as an example. In 65, world copper production was smaller uh, than today, of course. And you can see the predominance of um, contribution from North America and Africa. And roughly in proportion to, to the production rates, the diameters, you can see the complete change in, in regional contribution. And uh, of course, that's not a surprise to a lot of you here. But um, going back to the earlier one, the, the 65, the mid-60s, we were still in the post-war, uh, Cold War period. And the US government was still using the term of strategic minerals. And uh, so we did have an active U.S. Bureau of Mines supporting our industry. So there's a lot of contrib state-sponsored contribution there. We have some around the world, but proportionately less, I would say, than what we had in 65. Likewise, if you look at the companies who are producing for each of those sectors, and you look at the, how vested they were in research and development, um, I have a strong feeling, and when I speak to my contemporaries, I haven't found anyone who disagrees, that proportionately we have a lot less investment in research and development overall uh, between those two periods. So let me go on to a simple graphic of our cycles. I think everyone here understands what's meant by the cycle. We don't have a NASDAQ stock exchange index to tell us each day where we are in the cycle, but we know it in our gut where, where we are. This is a simple graphical representation. I used two cycles just to accommodate the labels, but the, all these labels can apply to a single cycle. Also need to explain that um, even keeping it simple, the, the real effects of these cycles are a number of curves that are out of phase with each other, depending whether you're an exploration geologist at one end or a builder, startup person at the other end, and of course an operator who has to live through all of it. So I'd like to just pick out um, a couple of things. I'm not going to go through all the labels, but um, the first First one I just want to mention, we are all familiar with the downside. I don't know how this pointer works, but if you look at the first downside, layoffs and loss of experience. This must have a, is it just the middle? Oh, it's that one. So when you come off here, these aren't precise points, but uh, somewhere on this decline, we get layoffs all around from the different sectors, whether you're, whether you're a producer, uh, a construction person, or... or uh, so we lose experience here, and at this side, we, we, have, we need new hires to repopulate, to execute during this hot time. And so you can imagine what this does when the busy time occurs, you end up with a high percentage of people who are first time in role at the time when we're trying to get things done. 
And if you add to that observation of engineers of today compared to engineers of 40 years ago, they're all impatient to move on and not do the same role twice. And that just compounds what I've just described. And I've done sometimes, I used to do what we call traffic lights, looking at the green, amber, or red scenario for the experience on a team, not to condemn the team or criticize them, but to understand what support they might need. And in recent times when I've done that, in, 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 and I'm talking about, I don't mean just the team who's building, but the team who are engaged in all respects, including the customer. The other, the other thing you'll see from the curve is um, this aspect I have here, lessons learned. When you come off those periods where, where bad things happen, people realize that oh, we want to capture the lessons learned, and I've seen a number of those. When you come to the next cycle, you'll see the same thing, except when you've lived through a number of cycles, you recognize a lot of them are lessons learned, forgotten, relearned, forgotten, and relearned. And, and it just depends on how many cycles you've seen. You know, some years ago, I was, um, happened to be at my son's place when my first granddaughter had her first day at school. And when she came home, of course, we, like every, everyone else, you ask, how was school? And the words promptly came out of her mouth and said, the boys don't listen. Teacher has to explain twice. And I think of this scenario, if we got down to twice, that would be a remarkable improvement. <laughs> and who can believe that we go through all of those impacts without mistakes? You know, we, we often say we learn from our mistakes, and I could, I could recite a, a number of them if time permitted, but uh, when I rehearsed this, I found there wasn't sufficient time. But I was, I was interested, um, I noticed just about two months ago, a report in, I can't remember what I was reading it from, and it was a um, report on work done here in uh, Phoenix by the University of Arizona. And they were, they were doing studies related to artificial intelligence. And uh, somehow, in artificial intelligence methodology, they had given the machine, if you like, stretch goals. And I can't explain how that's done in digital terms, but uh, that was the nature of what they were trying. And they found that the optimum learning rate in the artificial intelligence regime was when you're making 15% mistakes. 15%. Have you ever, has anyone ever, ever thought about, when you get to August and you've run out of your quota, what do you do? <laughs> and, you know, if 15%, I mean, we know that there is some number applies to we humans because uh, we often say we, and we do know from personal experience that we learn from mistakes. But if 15% was the right number, you would think then, for example, on this symposium, that 15% of our technical section was dedicated to talking about mistakes. Unless you're in the research lab, a researcher will properly record his mistakes because he knows information gained from what didn't work has equal value to the, to the information from things that do work. But as an industry, we suppress talking honestly about our mistakes. Is that we don't like the admission of guilt. And our lawyers don't like us admission of liability. But we, I, I think um, the whole aspect of capture of mistakes is, is something that uh, we don't do well. So this, I don't expect you to read, read this, um, just explain what it was. I'm going on to talk about project development and all the aspects. And you'll all be familiar with uh, the concepts of concept study. <coughs> pre-feasibility and feasibility leading into execution, one hopes. If you're in mining, 
you're, you're depleting your reserves every day, of course, your resources and reserves. So project development is part of the business. The, um, the roadmap here, it just represents the, the primary components. And um, those components are not unique to mining. Uh, well, some of them are, but the general principles of the whole thing uh, was, was is written up for many years, decades, uh, to meet the needs of the financing industry or uh, financing community. And I learned a lot of, of the needs of this working with a securities exchange lawyer in assembling reports uh, for the different phases here, and particularly the final phase, final feasibility. And um, so I learned a lot directly from someone who explained what what a securities exchange lawyer and what a banker would look for, not just in the correctness of information, but how it's, how it's explained, accounted for, and presented, and packaged. And uh, that, was, that was meaningful to me. If you, um, if you tr took someone from the 60s who was engaged in a similar um, development process, he would, and, and he came to see us today to live in our environment of doing this work, he would be immediately comfortable with the general uh, pattern of this work and the rigor it involves. But uh, on uh, looking at it more closely, he would begin to see some differences that have happened over those years. So let me just mention a couple. So there's the three phases, principal phases, and before I populate that, let me just mention a couple of things. A few days, decades ago, you would find, a, uh, or my experience well, anyway was, a customer would come for those discreetly, and for those not familiar with this whole process, by the way, this is a, a filter process for opportunity evaluation. So you have many more concept studies, or you should have many more than you do pre-feasibility and many more pre-feasibility than feasibility and for projects, of course. It, the, um, the primary goal that I recall customers would come for was, a, was a, a, me a measure of the feasibility and the economics of each of those phases. He was less interested in the precision and detail. He wanted a reliable, accurate measure. And sometimes, uh, once he got that measure, he, it would disappear and it might come back later years. The point is there was a dislocation in time very often for those phases. And that also meant a dislocation sometimes in the teams executing the work. And one good aspect of that was that uh, when these phases were initiated each time, the team that were doing it took a fresh accountability of the work. Now compared to Today is where I see a lot of those contiguous. And of course, you make more assumptions on the left-hand side and you gradually reduce those. But the great danger I see today where those, those become contiguous rather than dislocated in time and that fresh ac accountability, sometimes these assumptions subconsciously or otherwise flow into the next stage. And as we all know, repeating an assumption, no matter, how, no matter how many times you repeat it, does not make it into a fact. And so there's, I think, uh, in today's world, that's a point you have to be careful of. So let me go through some of the blocks where there has been some change to the, I, I won't call them good or bad, just changes. Resource reserves, remember the 50 year window I'm talking about, we were just seeing the beginning of uh, Craiging just came in at, uh, around the, in the 60s, and shortly after that, the computational um, skills and modeling, the spatial modeling, uh, uh, it just has added to the, the rigor and certitude around this aspect. And from what I described earlier of, of uh, interfacing with the securities lawyer, and we used to do um, a number of studies back in the 80s and 90s, which were debt financed. So based on the, realizing that you're, although you're working with the customer all the time, the, the, the real customer, 
that uh, did your term exam, if you like, at the end of the exercise was in fact the bankers team and the questions they had and the rigor that they required to, to make their financial decisions. And um, so I know that uh, this block was always very high. In some cases, people would say that was their top risk they were concerned about in the whole exercise. You know, and then, um, but with, you, with the modeling tools now, I would guess that that's uh, more easily satisfied in the banker's uh, requirements. And then, of course, what was influential during this 50-year period in 69 in Australia, uh, we had the instance of Poseidon Nickel. Uh, some of you might remember that. That was a, a stock bubble burst. There was a lot of promotion. There was some insider trading, which wasn't illegal, but there was insider trading. There was some promotion. And a lot of people in Australia invested their savings in this. I mean, private individuals, not, not, not the big investors that we think of in the US. And, a lot, and the bubble collapsed. People lost their money. And that's what woke up um, the people in Australia, and the result of which was the JORC code. Uh, joint, the J being joint between um, the American, uh, the, the Australian, um, uh, the Mineral Council of Australia, there was the geoscience committees, there were several technical committees, and the Australian Stock Exchange. So it was, it, the work was uh, done amongst those, which is why it was called joint. And later on in 97, uh, we had the BREAX incident, and uh, whereas the uh, first incident beside Nickel was, I think the industry treated that as an Australian problem, and the JORC lived its life in Australia. But when BREAX happened, uh, that hit uh, the global scenes and got global attention because it was, it was actually just unmistakable fraud. And from there on, um, all the country, mineral producing countries now have got the equivalent to a, a JORC. The definitions are consistent, the governance might vary. So overall, this block has just moved in the positive direction and is much stronger than what it was some decades ago. Uh, the next one, geometallurgy. 40 years ago, you would not have seen this word used in the, in the project development scenario. Um, the first time I came across it was, uh, I remember, in the mid-90s by uh, a gentleman, Bechtel, uh, late Ian Callow. Um, and Ian, Ian believed that the, the, the phrase was coined by Al Taylor, also at Bechtel, who happened to be, who was my first boss. And I didn't know that, but if, if Ian's correct, I could quite believe it because Al Taylor was absolutely passionate about the metallurgists being involved in the sampling of ore bodies and the test work and, uh, and so forth. And if you weren't involved, be thoroughly involved in the investigation and talk to the people who did before you even tried to design the plant. And um, Al Taylor used to admonish or remind you that very clearly when he, he would tell you, ore bodies do not lie. People sometimes do. And, and I think Al, if he came back today and saw what has happened since, where geometallurgy has become uh, a thorough uh, specialty in its own right with uh, sophisticated tools that align with, with uh, those of the mind and mind planning, I think he would he'd be thrilled. So overall, this, this has just become added to the robustness of the process in that period. Next one, I'd like to mention, th this block has had significant change in the whole approach. The, e the US had the EPA formed in 1970, and 72, I can remember having their first um, handbook standards and guides for workplace and uh, ambient air quality. 
and I used those in the plant design I was working on at the time. Ten years later, when I joined Bechtel, I, I met and did a lot of subsequent work with a colleague called Jim Murray, and he was a specialist in environmental issues and pollution controls. And Jim informed me, because he was familiar with the early formative years of those agencies, and he, he explained to me that um, in those early years of the agencies, the engineers within the agencies had actually come from our industry. So when people like Jim and others in the industry were dealing with environmental issues leading up to agreements, you had practicing engineers talking to practicing engineers. And their, their shared interest was in finding solutions. And um, you can imagine how that mechanism works quite well. Usually when engineers are talking to engineers, things happen uh, quite well. That was followed up in subsequent years with uh, more legal and the influence from activism and, and politics. And so that engineer to engineer uh, clarity became more, more clouded. And the, the EIS and today's world, uh, the engineers within the agencies tend to have been trained as environmental engineers, as opposed to the engineers we use in the practicing sense in designing, building, operating, whatever. So you could say that in today is the, engineer, the engineers within the agencies are more trained and equipped for the regulation part rather than the solution finding. And what Jim explained to me uh, in many, as many years, it used to be the EIS process, and I use just EIS for simplicity because the terminology can vary uh, by jurisdiction, but just simplifying it and referring to EIS, the whole EIS process used to be one of fact gathering for decisions by the project people. But in today's world, the EIS has become a process of decision making itself. It, has, it, has, it is now influencing the whole thing rather than being a contribution to, to the whole thing. And um, you know, in, in that regard, I was struck just a couple of uh, months ago noted following the, the Brexit news in the UK and noticed these quotes from a Brexiteer explaining why he wanted to leave the EU. And it was, a, it, it was just that subtle difference between being allowed to do things that are not banned to being banned to do anything that, that is not permitted. And in some ways, that kind of mirrors the, the kind of changes that we've had has happened over the years in the environmental approach. At the same time, I'm not criticizing the uh, environment. I, I don't know anyone in the industry who wants to do less than the right thing. And uh, the best thing, but at the same time, I know that those who are, who are trying to move a, an investment prospect forward are looking for something manageable in the process. Do the right thing, but have, have some knowledge of the outcome. And it was the uncertainty of that outcome which drove investment out of the US, as most of you know, in the, in the 90s. And um, in the 90s, when we went overseas and did projects overseas and worked like this, uh, other countries were happy to incorporate the US requirements and, uh, and standards, etc. But the pr so there was no dilution of the intent, the end solution result. But the process is different. And now I see in other countries where the development on the government side has taken, the, taken some of those countries back to where the US was in the 90s and introducing more uncertainty. The um, next one is engineering and design. You know, the, the block I've just explained to you, the, the whole EIS um, requirement has become lengthier, costlier, and uh, the, the, the process has, has demanded more information and detail uh, to, to, to um, to meet those requirements than we used to have at the, at the study stage. 
And so the studies have becoming longer, have become longer, um, more expensive, of course, and having to deal with a lot of that detail. And that, that has moved a lot of the decision making over to the left, so that you, you practically have to know that you're going to proceed with the project when you start committing yourself to the cost and time of that feas final feasibility stage. And, and that has had cross uh, uh, ripple effects, I'll touch on in the next uh, slide. But for the engineering and design, of course, in the 50 years that I've seen, we've had tremendous changes from what I mentioned earlier, the, the first uses of computer and uh, to uh, what we have today. Uh, when I was manager of engineering, uh, I always had access to lots of data that had been accumulated over many years. And we watched that data very carefully. We used that data to measure, to benchmark. And, um, and we went from, to, from manual uh, production of design to 2D and subsequently to 3D. I used that data and I saw no improvement in productivity. We had fancier tools, but it, to me, from what I could see, uh, see and measure, there was no improvement in time, money, or effort. So why did we do it? There was simply no going back because um, the skill sets of the preceding methods were just simply no longer available. Regrettably, I still remember those. In the 70s, when I went to review a, a design, I go into a drawing office, for example, and I walk up to, I knew what each of them were doing, walk up to a, a draftsman at that time, and before I exchanged any words with him, I knew what he was working on, I could see what his progress was, I could see what he was thinking about, and how deeply he was thinking about it. That was as I was walking up, before, before I spoke any words with him. And that was simply because the old method, the draftsman would have two drawing boards and a table. One, draft, one drafting board with his finished work, clean, you see the progress. Second one, the sketches, you could see what he's thinking about. The table, you could see the catalogs he's got open and, uh, and, and what he, what, how, how he's going about uh, maintenance, operability, etc. And I tried to look over somebody's shoulder at a, a screen and I, I, I can't see that so easily. It's a different process to do that kind of review. And every time we've gone from a manual method, um, as I say, there's no going back. It's just part of, of the evolution that we've gone through. But each stage has required the right kind of overlap of the old skills and the young skills. And the reason I, 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 we, we didn't get that productivity games is you would have the old skills that you were still dependent on, spending more time to transpose their ideas into those new tools than they used to be able to do simply by, by the old methods. And that's, that'll be different too with, with today's generation. Uh, it was just, uh, that's what it was like through these transitions we had. And I can remember too, with, it wasn't just the drafting method, I, say, I remember uh, as we used other tools like CFD, uh, I would uh, expose, I would fund some efforts just to see what it could do for me. I would test those results. I mean, it's always nice to get these pretty pictures and, and pressure lines, etc. But in the early days, I'd put them in front of the old hands. They would do some quick calculations and, and declare rubbish. And, and, and uh, further investigations showed that's true. It took a lot of uh, work between old and new to build the, the credibilities in those new tools. And, and, and I can remember through that whole process, uh, numerous times when, when you relied on the old skills and, uh, to, to actually just sit back and test whether something looked right. And uh, it makes me wonder sometimes how, who's going to do the look right test when we move into machine learning and artificial intelligence. The, uh, this is another block that would not have featured uh, 50 years ago. 
as I said, the, uh, uh, in the feasibility stage, you were not getting immersed in that detail. And those, you know, as we moved into the uses of computer in design and engineering, initially you can imagine that it was each discipline, each function uh, for themselves. They would develop the tools um, for their own needs, just like they did in the old manual days. And then there's the later trans uh, realization that you need to, uh, you need some of those things to talk to each other, uh, but they're all developed on different platforms. So there's, there's, there was other band-aids that were designed to be able to transfer data between all these different developing skill sets that contribute to this. And, uh, and we've moved on from, from a lot of those transition stages to what I would think of now is, is, is the shoebox approach, where all the data, regardless of who wants it, is in one box. And, um, and that's a concept we have here with project, project database uh, planning. And 4D, for those, I mean, I think everyone knows what 2D and 3D are. 4D, for those who might not be familiar, is simply adding uh, the element, the dimension of time to the 3D. So that's why it's planning. And that time can be uh, quite expansive. You know, in the simple case, you're dealing with maybe just the time aspects of installing. Uh, but you can work all the way back to the supplier, the, the whole supply chain. Uh, to, to cover that uh, time dimension. So it becomes a, a very powerful database, and I think it's a major transition. It's one that Bechtel uh, first explored in the 70s, actually, but the software simply wasn't there to do it. And it was revisited again, Bechtel uh, working with, um, with um, Hitachi in the mid-80s, uh, but it was still far too early. So you could you could see that's 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 uh, practically th at least three decades from the first concept to where we are today, which is still not where we have. Uh, you could say that 4D is mainstream. At the same time, you can go back um, to some examples in the world. Uh, one uh, mentioned is the London Olympics, 2012. Um, was performed to the equivalent of 7D, all the way through design, all the way through to the end of life cycle, which of course is, in their case, a lot shorter than the mine life, but including all the aspects of dismantling, disposal, recycling, etc. So, and some infrastructure studies, uh, infrastructure works are done uh, to, to that kind of level. But infrastructural projects tend to have less overlap between engineering and construction. In our world, partly because of those cycles, when we want things done, we want them done now. And we have a lot of overlap between design and construction. And so this, this aspect of 4D, when you get into this field, you're, you're into the, you can easily get into the several million line items in that database. And so here, here's a case where that lengthening and introduction of detail for the feasibility study that was introduced by that environmental requirement is now taken advantage of because you can take use of that time and start this process. If you leave this until after post feasibility study and, and try it during execution, you're too late. You cannot, you cannot build those models in that space of time. So you can see how the feasibility study has actually grown in its scope, its depth, and has become uh, as much a feasibility and economic uh, evaluation as it is one of execution readiness. So if we go on to um, these two, I'll just handle quickly, one on, one off. For the reasons I've just explained, the whole original concept of basic engineering has practically disappeared. When you, if you're doing feasibility study, including project uh, uh, database planning, uh, that, that simply just doesn't have relevance anymore. Same time, operational readies, because of the sophistication of the systems, you always had that in some degree. It, it would be handled very similarly 
in all feasibility studies. But now, if you want to be prudent about uh, startup, you start that process of operational readiness um, all the way through a, fe a feasibility study. Um, sustainability, um, this bottom block, I, I don't distinguish the color, but the last one I put up is the bottom there. This is another one that would not, you would not have seen 40 years ago, or, or you know, it's, it's not entirely new in concept. Even the original EIS work would always have a subsection for socio-economic uh, evaluation. So it was always there, but it's now stands on its own feet. And uh, I'll just outline uh, the history of that. Uh, the, uh, the term sustainable development was actually coined by Gro Harlem uh, Grundland when she was commissioned by United Nations to address global environmental and development uh, problems. And she issued that report in 1987. Uh, before that, she was, um, she was the Prime Minister of Norway and after this report, she went back and did, she did two terms in, in that role. So that was, that was uh, 1987, and that was followed by, in 1991, by the World Bank and IFC, when they introduced a, a, a pollution and abatement uh, handbook. In 2003, IFC introduced uh, the first set of eight performance guidelines that were accepted, uh, re accepted by multiple banks and countries in what was called the equator principles. And so you think that, that the whole aspect of sustainable development um, would be a structured, codified approach. And that's simply not true. I have not seen that part of a study addressed equally uh, amongst the different ones. It, it, it is one that we're still fumbling on as an industry, I think, to get our arms around. At the same time, I would imagine this one has elevated to near the top of the banker's risk box. And I show, I show it stretching right to the extreme left because as soon as you have a drill crew or people activities interfacing with the communities you're going to be engaging with, you've got a Petri disk disc that's, that's just going to nurture all kinds of assumed commitments that you, you can't unravel and have to deal with at the end. So this, this I think, is a high-risk area for, for project development because it's just so difficult to contain. Um, if I go on, so, but altogether, the whole process, I think, has got a lot of robustness. And I mentioned earlier, it was originally for financing purposes, but even in cases where, where a project is not... Um, uh, debt financed and, and the companies are financing off the balance sheet I still all the companies follow the same rigor because the rigor is good um, so I've gone through financing just a quick one of financing financing is not new but um, I remember I used to talk to bankers just to get an idea of what their concerns were and uh, one of the times I did that I was surprised by one of his high risk uh, elements, and he described it as senior management who do not understand the technical complexities. And so I would counsel the young engineers, I find today young engineers want to climb that ladder as quickly as possible. And my counsel, if you climb too fast on that ladder, you might be one of those, become one of those managers that banker was afraid of. So Altogether, a rigorous process, how did we do? You might say, not another hockey stick. I, I mentioned that we had lots of numbers that we had to follow and metrics. We had a boss at one time who people could be afraid of because he would say, if you don't know your quantities, if you don't know your costs, you know nothing. And so you had to be well prepared to make sure you were not one of those nothing people. And 
one of the popular metrics um, that we always had, was particularly with customer engagement, was something that relate to dollar, dollars per ton for capacity, et cetera. I mean, it was always convenient, it was nice to be able to compare your plant with another just in terms of something uh, dollars per ton. But what I found years ago is that, I mean, dollars per ton are fine for contemporary comparisons, but um, they get out of date very quickly, and the adjustments for escalation and all the categories is extremely complex. And uh, eventually, some years ago, I started looking for a dimensionless measure. So what this shows is a vertical axis, which is simply my index, if you like, and I define that index by taking the total capital cost. And by total, I mean what the owner is, what the owner would report in the annual report or to the board as the cost of the whole undertaking. And then I divide that by the, the revenue using the design capacities and recoveries, et cetera, uh, for, for, for that plant for one year. And since I'm taking them for the same year or within a year's worth of inflation, it becomes dimensionless and, uh, and I don't have to adjust over time. So I, I was following that, and I was, at the time I followed that in that bottom section, I was always surprised at, at the, 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 the range. But when I, in each case, when I'd go and look at the information behind the dots, and I'd only use dots where I had uh, reliable information, not hearsay, but I, I could rely upon the numbers, because I don't want to confuse uh, the uncertainty of data with the variability of data. And the, the range you see here between 0.5 and 2, I thought was very wide. But if, if I go in and look at the information behind them, I could understand why one would be high and the other uh, with operating costs, etc. You could see and understand. Around 2012-13, I extended my chart into some of the, uh, the information that became available for pro new projects people were looking at. And I saw it was going out of bounds. Um, so that gap year you see at the end between the two uh, clouds, uh, I had a lot of those data. I've taken those out because here, those are all projects built or being built. And so this right-hand hockey stick really surprises me. Um, you, I, I've got the data and, I, and it, it poses more questions than answers. I'm not pretending this as a, as a conclusion answer thing. But I, when I look inside that, uh, that uh, hockey stick cloud, it's unmistakable to me that we have shifted out of what used to apply for some years. And, and I, I won't pretend to have the answer to that. I think it's complex. But why have we suddenly gone above what used to prevail. And if I go back to, uh, just to finish off, um, the last slide, technology, of course, is an, is an avenue for, for improving costs. And that's, that's why we pursue those things. But technology is hard. Jim, you had for, with HPGR, introducing just, a, 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 I mean, it was a known technology but introducing it just into the scale of operations that we have is hard. And it takes a champion like Jim to actually make things like that happen. And so uh, for, for a breakthrough technology which can change us and bring us back down on that curve, maybe we have to question how we, how we approach technology in a manner that, that is impervious to all the influences of those cycles. I don't think we're good at doing that. And I think that's that's the end of my talk. I would, that's my two times 10 to the minus five scale down of 50 years, so I had to <laughs> skip some things. But if I've got a minute, Scott, I'd just like to, we're often asked uh, by our younger people, how do we get into this industry? And I have in my pocket here two books that are the answer to that in my respect. Those are two books that I read during my trips back and forward in the bus to high school. 
and one is minerals in industry, metals in the service of man, and I still have their deserved sp spot in my bookshelves. <laughs> so with that, thank you very much. For me, it's been a 55-year classroom, and I've really enjoyed it. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. I'm sure we can all say that it seems like oftentimes lessons learned beyond 10 years is indeed a stretch goal. It seems like we might remember lessons for one more project, but then people move on and you're, the lesson's out the door. But we always try. Um, so I need to invite to the stage. Are we missing a page? We are missing a page. Here we go. Now I'll turn the podium over to Dave, Dave Perkins, um, who will present the Rong Yu Wan PhD dissertation scholarship certificate. Dave. All right, thank you, Scott. Um, so on behalf of the 2019-2020 uh, Scholarship Award uh, Committee from uh, MPD, I have the great pleasure to uh, present the Ron Yuan PhD Dissertation Scholarship Certificate today. This scholarship, which comes with a check of $1,500, honors the memory of Dr. Ron Yuan, an internationally renowned metallurgist, 22-year member of SME, an SME distinguished member, a Wadsworth Award recipient, and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. During her career, Dr. Wan not only made many important contributions in the field of metallurgical engineering, but also tirelessly mentoring uh, many young scientists and students. This year's award goes to Dr. Zimbao Yang for her dissertation on leaching characteristics, characteristics of rare earth elements from bituminous coal-based sources. Dr. Yang is currently serving as a research professor in the Department of Mining Engineering at the University of Kentucky. She received a Bachelor of Engineering from China University of Mining and Technology in 2011, a Master of Science from the Southern Illinois University Carbondale in 2014, and a PhD in Mining Engineering from the University of Kentucky in 2019. Her research specialty is in extractive metallurgy and mineral processing with specific areas including surface characterization, leaching, precipitation, solution chemistry, coal preparation, froth flotation, fine particle separation, and dewatering. Her current research is based on the project funded by the U.S. Department of Energy with a goal of designing and optimizing a process to extract rare earth elements from coal and to produce marketable rare earth oxide product on a continuous pilot scale operation. So I am pleased to present this award certificate to Dr. Yang. Zimbo. Dr. Yang will be giving uh, a talk on her dissertation topic at the uh, Rare Earth Elements in Coal Session 1 tomorrow at 10.45 a.m. I hope you will all uh, come and listen to, uh, to her talk. So now I'll turn it back over to Scott. Thanks. I'll talk fast. I can do that. Yes, yeah, so we're pretty much done for the day. I just want to remind everybody before we actually leave that tomorrow night is the famous Scotch Nightcap. We'll again have base medals playing. Tickets are $60 each, and it's become a real good fundraiser for all of our scholarships um, within MPD. So please get out there and attend. Um, it, we have to thank the generous sponsorship of our executive sponsor, Weir Minerals. Title sponsor is Molly Cop and Odotech and UPG and supporting sponsors of FLS and Solvay. We really ha appreciate the support of the vendors because they are part of our industry. They're part of our family. We all help we'll, we'll work for them at some point in the future. You know how that works. And also the MPD lunch is on Wednesday from noon until 1.45 p.m. in the Phoenix Convention Center, north 224 A and B. 
go early if you are going to the lunch, and hopefully you all are, but go early to look at all the posters we have out front. I think everybody's seen the success we've had with the student posters. This year we have 26 posters in the, in the ballroom out front, so please spend some time, go out there, talk to the students, see what the next generation is gonna be. Again, we'll be working for them probably in five years. Um, and thanks to our lunch title sponsor of M3 Engineering and supporting sponsors, again, Molly Cop and Asenko. Molly Cop is really showing up quite often, and again, we appreciate all of our sponsors. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and coming, and we'll see you tomorrow night and the next day. We'll see you next year. Thank you, sir.